story is very personal. And I always wanted to be a doctor when I was a kid. But when I was 18 years old, I was hit by a drunk driver at about 75 miles an hour. And, you know, accidents, they may take their toll initially, but they really have a, um, a long-lasting effect on your body. And after my accident, you know, I had gone through the nine months of physical therapy and seen the orthopedic surgeons and, and whatnot. And I'd gotten to a point to where, you know, things were sort of okay, but they really weren't great. I mean, especially after being in med school and studying, I usually felt like my um, shoulders were implanted into my ears for days afterwards. And I started to develop very severe headaches. Um, and this was just kind of like the norm for me. I'd go to the doctor's student health at Hahnemann, which unfortunately is closing, as you all know, and um, they really didn't know what to do. And eventually I had sinus surgery to see if that would help, and it didn't really help. And I'd just gone through um, seeing a number of different physicians. I really wasn't one for opioids, and thank God the opioid epidemic wasn't as rampant as, as it is now. I really didn't want to take pain medicine, and I would try to take some Advil periodically, or try to hide underneath the covers is usually what I would do after an exam and, and pass out. So I didn't really have such a fun life. Um, nevertheless, I had heard that Dr. Koop had had these treatments for his spine in the 1960s. And uh, they were the, the uh, less advanced form of what we do today, but it was still extremely effective for him. And he actually became my patient in the early 2000s. And this is the first time that he needed a touch-up was years and years later, which was pretty impressive. So I began to research what he had because it was coming from the Surgeon General. I thought there was some legitimacy to this. It just wasn't some kind of you know, nonsense snake oil thing that he went for something and he got better. I thought it was a pretty reputable guy. And uh, you know, I could learn something from him, even though this was a case report. So anyhow, there are many options for pain, and um, as I mentioned, you know, I did go through uh, several, and especially more of the conventional medicine, uh, treatments with anti-inflammatories and pain medicine and physical therapy. And then, as you can see, you know, things progress, and if these initial things do not work, then sometimes patients end up with uh, back surgeries, um, which unfortunately today I just saw a um, physician in my office who would he has uh, multi-level um, fusion with disc replacements above and below, and he still has extreme radiculopathy and neck spasm and tightness. So unfortunately, sometimes we see these cases that are patients who have already gone through surgery, and they're still having a lot of pain and a lot of disability, and it's a shame. Yesterday, I saw a woman who had meniscal replacement, sorry, meniscal debridement um, about eight years ago, and now her knee is really bothering her, and for the past few years, you know, she's tried the hyaluronic acid injections and um, has had cortisone injections, and these really have stopped working for her. And our job is to try to prevent knee replacement on her. Um, she doesn't want to have it. She works as a nurse. She's very active and wants to maintain that activity, and she's only in her 50s, so to have a knee replacement at this age is probably the best thing. Um, unfortunately, you know, as time goes on, we learn more, and meniscectomies were all too common, and now that we're learning that the data shows that it unfortunately hastens the need for knee replacement in patients who are arthritic. So we need to rethink a lot of these types of treatments that are going on, and unfortunately patients think that going, you know, for surgeries, like going to Home Depot, where you kind of go in, you kind of get your nuts and bolts and screws and walk out and everything's fine, and it really isn't like that for um, many of the people that I see. Uh, and then also we have the alternative therapies, which a lot of people are trying on their own, like acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, uh, different supplements, which are typically you know, some form of anti-inflammatory, um, whether you know, working on different pathways like COX-2 or, or just working um, generically over the system. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And then what I specialize in is working um, with regenerative therapies. So typically the patients that I see have kind of already marched down the line and they usually have tried everything um, when they may or may not have had surgery. So a lot of the patients I see would like to avoid surgery as well and have something um, other than surgery. So anyhow, uh, this is the topic of regenerative orthopedic medicine and I think it's, a, like I said, it's an up and coming topic and um, it's getting more popular because of sports stars and um, other people using it and having success. 
Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of negative press as well for some people who have used it unscrupulously, and that we can talk about because there are FDA regulations surrounding this. So anyway, um, there's many different things that can be used in order to try to heal one's body. The general premise of all these things is basically like fixes like. So when we were young, we sprained our ankle. Our ankle's still not sprained years later because the body repaired it. The premise of regenerative medicine is basically trying to trigger reactions in the body that will cause damaged areas to heal, okay? The most basic form is prolotherapy, and prolotherapy actually dates back to the time of Hippocrates, and um, it was thought that during the time of the Olympics, the javelin throwers would dislocate their shoulders or get tendonitis, and um, Hippocrates would basically take sort of like a hot poker and go right into their shoulder and <laughs> kind of has an inflammatory response, and their shoulder was better, and they were able to throw a, a javelin much better. Uh, nevertheless, you know, that's evolved, and now typically we use a lot of dextrose, dextrose solution, which is extremely safe. Uh, you know, you can really have, if you know how to place the injections properly, those solutions are really not going to cause any type of complications in the patient, which is really important. There are other solutions that are used, like uh, phenol, which is a neurolytic sometimes, uh, serapin, which is an irritant, pumice, and even some doctors use testosterone, which I don't use in my practice, any of these, but these are some other things that are used. Um, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, you may have heard of it because Kobe, Bar uh, Kobe Bryant got it in his knee, um, and there's a lot of other people who have had it. It dates back to use in the 1980s, but not necessarily for uh, sports and for pain. It was originally used actually during cardiac surgeries to where the grafts were somewhat leaky. So they decided to take out platelets and, and growth factors and they would actually combine it with calcium thrombin and make a gel and put that gel around the vessels in order to help them heal faster and have less complications. So that's how it started and then it actually was used a lot in dental implants as well uh, to help with dental healing. So this is derived in the patient's own blood and uh, it might contain a few red cells, but we're taking the red cells out and essentially concentrating the platelets and growth factors and, and some white blood cells. And it contains lots of, um, lots of ingredients that help healing, like platelet growth factor, normal growth factors, um, IGF, TGF beta, and many others. And again, this is basically extracting out the way that your body heals and putting it into a damaged area to help it heal. So. Adipose derived stem, stem cells are a newer um, technique, and the adipose has the greatest concentration of stem cells in the body because that's where the stem cells are stored in our fat. Uh, furthermore, um, stem cells derived from the fat um, are generally in a more mature form, and therefore they're very low risk to use. The nice thing about the fat is not only does it contain stem cells, uh, but it also contains other cells that are called preadipocytes and pericytes. And these types of cells are chondrogenic. So for example, when they're injected into a knee, these cells actually help to, permit, to promote the repair of cartilage, which is really exciting. Uh, bless you. So they really have a multitude of uses. Furthermore, you know, fat in itself can be somewhat of a cushion for a knee, just like a hyaluronic acid, but it's much more dense. And it comes from the patient. These procedures are done with the liposuction-like process, and it's done just with local anesthesia. It's very well tolerated. Low volumes are needed of fat. Most people do like getting their fat taken out. Um, so it's kind of like a, uh, you know, a two for one. You, know, you lose a little bit of your love handles, and you gain some improvement in your, uh, in your near hip. So that is good, but there are FDA regulations around this. And um, the FDA requires that tissue to be transplanted be minimally manipulated and homologous of use. So we can use fat into a knee because it provides a cushion, um, and we can minimally manipulate it, meaning that we can use certain processes to break it down, but we can't add enzymes to it or things like that. And um, these procedures now are not allowed by the FDA. We used to use them and they, they really work very well, but we stopped and I engineered a new technique um, for using it and using FDA clear devices. So, um, you know, there's regulations that have come up, not necessarily because these procedures 
were bad, but unfortunately the people who were using it weren't using it properly and created problems, and then you know, regulation steps in. There are other biologics also, the amniotic membrane, um, which you know, people think of stem cells. I use a lot of this. I think it works really, really well, and I'll explain to you why as we go and talk about the biology behind this. But amniotic membrane really doesn't contain any cells. It contains growth factors. And this is really important because everyone thinks that stem cells are these transformative things like they're going to turn into all different types of tissue. Everyone has like these mythical and magical thoughts about how stem cells work. Well, they probably don't work that way. They really work by secreting growth factors and by recruiting the immune system to come to the area to help heal tissue. And it's more of a biological interaction that occurs rather than these cells transforming into all kinds of things. That's why it's almost, um, you know, fanfare when people come to you like, oh, you know, I have this problem, like, can you just inject a stem cell into it? And it's called something to turn into a new healthy tissue. Well, it doesn't really work like that. Um, amniotic membrane, if it comes from a reputable source and an FDA cleared lab, are generally very safe because they're freeze dried. So you're really losing a lot of the risk of infection. They're all screened for infection as well. Uh, so it happens to be a very reliable tissue, especially if you get it from a good source. Warden's jelly and chorionic products, again, come from uh, placental tissue. They do contain live stem cells, but again, um, it's difficult to say if these are really allowed by the FDA. They really don't have an IND. I don't use them. It's very sketchy whether we can use these in clinical practice or not. You know, some people think that they're using them as a practice of medicine. They're a doctor. They can do whatever they want. Um, but these types of products and um, other things like exosomes, people are using the derived from human tissue. Uh, but again, there's really no regulation behind it. There's no IND behind it. So legally, you know, I don't think that they really fit within FDA requirements. Uh, furthermore, they need specific cryo uh, preservation, and you have to have specific equipment to keep them, or else they really will be ineffective. So, anyhow, um, the really neat thing, you know, I like biochemistry, and the really neat thing is how do these things work? And they work by using, as, as I said, different growth factors. So, for example, TIMP1 and TIMP2 inhibit metalloproteinases, and metalloproteinases within the joint are very inflammatory and cause degradation. Isn't it great that now we have a way to shut them off? Some of the other growth factors that we use stimulate hyaluronic acid production within the knee. Now we know a lot of patients get wear, you know, their effects wear off from HAs, but what if we can put something into the knee that, can, that basically stimulates the production of HA, along with reducing inflammation? Um, so I think that these things are really interesting because of the biology, and you can see here, like we have IL-1RA, which is a potent anti-inflammatory, um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the orthokine or regenokine treatments that were done in Germany um, by Dr. Waring, who had treated a number of uh, professional golfers. Um, and he basically takes blood and, and concentrates IL-1-RA and injects it into people and makes them feel better for about six months to a year using this type of treatment. Um, but the rest of this is also uh, with stimulating angiogenesis, vasculogenesis. As I said, injecting blood into a joint may not be helpful, but if you can get the immune system attracted into an area and start to stimulate angiogenesis and get the repair into a tissue, then it helps to heal it over time. So we all went to gross anatomy, and we all looked and dissected down, and we saw that ligament tissue and tendon tissue is white, right? It's not red and bloody, it's white tissue. And it's white tissue because it has a very poor blood supply. These tissues get damaged and injured, and often when we get older, they don't heal or they break down because of a lack of a good supply of circulation and growth factors. So this is essentially providing growth factors into these damaged areas to help with the healing process. And the nice thing is the healing process is natural. It's not synthetic. So we don't develop scar tissue or anything else like that in the areas that are treated. So the most important thing that I learned as a resident is that you have to learn what the problem is. And you learn most of what you need by talking to the patient and examining them. And this, unfortunately, is something that's lost in an art and in some of the subspecialists, especially when people come to me with orthopedic problems. And it's almost every day where I hear that, oh, you know, the doctors looked at the x-ray or MRI and they didn't really examine me. And 
I don't know how you're going to find out what's wrong with the patient, especially in a five minute visit, just looking at an x-ray. So talking to the patient is really a wonderful thing because you learn what their problem is and they almost tell you what their diagnosis is and you can figure things out over time. Observation, I like to watch how a person walks because you can see things in their feet and ankle and hips and with their pelvic tilt and see how their shoulders are. It's almost every single day, I'm gonna show you the slides on this, I have patients who come in like this, almost every day. Um, I like to do a very detailed palpatory physical examination because you need to feel the joints and feel the ligaments and tendons and things like that. And um, if anyone wants, they can always visit me in my office and I can teach them some of these things and also show my public tool treatment, which we'll talk later about. Of course, we're gonna take in consideration their x-rays or MRIs, but we need to take those into consideration. Every radiology report says everything needs to be considered within the clinical subset. So we need to use our brains, not just look at the test and say, okay, well, this is your problem. Because I can tell you, if I treated my back pain patients based upon their MRIs, I'd probably only be about 20% successful. And that would make people very happy. So we're gonna talk about arthritis and meniscal tears first. And obviously there's different types of arthritis, whether it's you know, inflammatory or infectious or degenerative. And the neat thing is, is that both the types of these things, well, well, infection treatments, you know, infection we really don't treat as well with regenerative medicine, but some inflammatory conditions, because there are anti-inflammatory factors in the things we use can help patients with rheumatoid um, and can help patients with psoriatic arthritis. Degenerative conditions are not just wear and tear, and there's more research showing that we also have patients who have family histories of arthritis. What's going on with them? We know that these people have an abundance of inflammatory cytokines in their joint, and the way that regenerative medicine may help them is not by just rebuilding the, the degenerative region from wear and tear, but also by modulating their cytokines which I think is really neat because we can actually stop the process. So here you can see arthritis of the knee and you see on the left side we have what looks to be healthy cartilage and healthy bone and then there we see very commonly where the medial portion of the knee starts to wear. And it wears, as I said, not just from a loss of structural support, which I'll show you where we see a lot of things happening, um, but also from inflammatory mediators and they start to break down the cartilage and the bone and cause problems. So we want to try to regenerate as much as possible um, of these areas. Interestingly enough, there's a very strong ligament that runs on the inside called the medial lateral ligament. And I could say that probably 95% of the time when I see patients with osteoarthritis, they have damage to their MCL, which is subacute, never shows up on the MRI, is always there, is always very painful. If you ask your patients with knee problems if they have trouble going up and down stairs, most of them say yes, right? Most of them say yes. And most of that problem is from damage in the MCL. Therefore, if we can reconstruct and regenerate the MCL, it's like rebuilding the person's own internal knee brace. So you give them a knee brace, they may feel better, but it is clumsy and uncomfortable. But if we can rebuild the MCL using regenerative medicine as part of the process, you're giving the person that brace back and then they can start to go up and down the stairs more normally, which is really a wonderful thing. So here's a study, and again, I, you know, I think it was important to look at things like this on a biochemical level. And if you look at the conclusion, it basically said that PRP helped with the proliferation of chondrocytes, decreased apoptosis, and increased autophagy, basically taking the debris out, putting new tissue in, and helping to grow cartilage. And this is all done through basically decreasing metalloproteins and helping to increase growth factors within the joint. So I think it's a really neat thing to look at the biology behind things and see how you know, our body really does have the ability to cure itself or to at least help itself get better. So this is a study that I published and as far as I know, it was kind of the first of its kind. And we were really lucky in being able to do this because the, the patient that we had was really very pro stem cell and he wanted to see what would happen. And he was willing to undergo before and after arthroscopy of his meniscal tear, okay? So anyhow, in this study, what we did is I harvested fat out of him, we prepared the fat, 
um, using enzymes to get this, the uh, chromovascular fraction out, which, as I said, contains growth factors, stem cells. It contains the preadipocytes and the pericytes. And he was injected into the joint around where the meniscus was damaged. And he also um, received subsequent treatments of PRP, the platelet-rich plasma, every few weeks, okay? And the, this just describes like how we, um, how we prepared the sample. The neat thing is, is that when we went back and looked, you could see in the probe that his meniscal tear is pretty much gone. It healed. <clears throat> so I thought that that was really good and his symptoms were gone and he was um, back on the ski slopes and doing everything that he loved at you know, 58 years old. He was extremely happy about this because otherwise he was facing you know, a lifelong pain and disability and we changed that and gave him his function back and again restored the tissue. Yes? Where exactly is the tear on the left? So the tear on the left, if you can see the linear lines through there where, around where the probe is, can you see that? I don't have a pointer, but it's all in, in here where the tear is in the meniscus. And then here, the meniscus is nice and clean. Can you see that? No. Yeah, but that, that's just what it looks like under arthroscopy. And I also, I wasn't the one, I mean, this was verified by an orthopedic surgeon as well, so it's not just my little uh, conjecture, you know? Because she looked all around his knee, and, and his knee really looked great. So again, a really important thing, and I'm going to talk touch on this a little bit later, is biomechanics as well. So with a person's knee, you can see when their pelvis tilts, their knee rotates in, and it puts a lot of additional medial pressure on the knee. And this is why I think in evaluation of patients, it's so important to look and see how they're standing and they're walking because any pelvic tilt or laxity in the ankle or laxity in the foot with a collapsed arch is gonna rotate and put additional pressure and torque on the knee. So we can fix the knee as good as we like, but if we don't take care of these underlying problems, the patient's just going to re-injure because you haven't corrected the biomechanics. So I think it's extremely important to correct the biomechanics of the patient whether it's a knee problem, hip problem, or back, or back problem, they all you know, need the correction of biomechanics. And it's really, really important. And I'm gonna show you a technique that I developed as well in order to correct this. So during this um, study where, um, where we published these results, uh, it was very well tolerated. There were really no adverse reactions other than soreness after the procedure, uh, which was somewhat minimal. Um, but again, the patient well tolerated. He didn't need any kind of pain medicine besides uh, some Tylenol. He did very well and continued to do well. And we said, of course, like any other thing that's, that's new and up and coming, yes, we need more studies to validate this and show that it works on, on many cases. There are uh, studies that have been published by my colleagues where they've done before and after MRI in order to see meniscal tears improving. Um, that may or may not always work because sometimes you still have a lingering healing process and you might still see bright signals on the MRI that can be misconstrued as tears that aren't. Um, so arthroscopy is kind of the gold standard um, for this, but it's kind of hard to get a patient to be convinced to have before and after arthroscopy. So again, as I mentioned, you know, we really need to address everything in the knee and not just the joint. The biggest one that I always see is the medial collateral ligament, which is on the inside of the knee and kind of runs right along the knee joint, runs down. Almost every one of my patients that comes in with knee pain has problems with the MCL. They almost always do. And if I just helped them with their intraarticular problem and avoided or ignored the extraarticular problem, the patient just wouldn't get better. Furthermore, there's a ligament here called the coronary ligament, which supports the meniscus. So you could have a tear in the meniscus, but it might be the pressure on the coronary ligament that's actually giving the patient pain. And there are studies, which I'm going to show you, that um, where they repaired the coronary ligament and the patient got better. So anyhow, uh, this, page, this uh, study here was a double-blinded um, uh, trial using um, PRP and basically showed that PRP had a statistically significant improvement 
uh, when compared to hyaluronic acid or saline injections in the knee. And the result of the treatment lasted for well over a year to where the other two groups did not have a long lasting result. So again, it's nice data to see, it was significant and the patients had improved. So this was good, a good level one evidence. This here is, is similar to what I mentioned before, to where the doctors knew and understood that the degenerative process is both intra-articular and extra-articular. So these physicians treated the patients intra-articularly with PRP, but also did treat along the coronary ligament and treated the MCL as well. And this was published this year, and these patients um, all had achieved a very significant improvement in their pain and also, interestingly enough, anyone in the treatment group didn't drop out. So the patients were getting better along, along the treatment and they continued and stayed in treatment, which was nice. So back pain, I think we all have seen lots and lots and lots and lots of patients with back pain in our office. And statistically, 87% of Americans will experience back pain in their life and often it can be very lingering. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of back pain, whether it's a sprain or a strain or some type of chronic issue like spondylolisthesis, which is a slippage in the spine, spinal stenosis, which is degeneration that, that presses onto the nerves. Uh, we see patients with compression fractures. Uh, unfortunately, there's other things that can cause pain as well that need to be ruled out, uh, whether it's uh, vascular issues, uh, because sometimes patients with vascular insufficiency in the legs may present with back pain. Patients with labral tears of the hip may present with back pain. And um, unfortunately, patients with metastatic cancer can lose that in back pain as well. A tethered cord is something that happens developmentally, not something that we see very often. So we already talked about the traditional approaches using anti-inflammatories, epidural injections, and I'm sure we've all had our patients go through the milieu of that with limited amounts of success or varied success, and then sometimes they need surgery and sometimes they don't. Uh, but again, I think that we really need to address the biomechanics. And again, I bring this up with the pelvic tilt because if your pelvis is tilted, look how much strain and strain it just puts right across the lower back, just from something simple like that. Now, this is a treatment that I developed with the tilted pelvis. And you can see how the patient is walking and she's really wobbling very bad. This is a patient who has back problems and a vascular necrosis of her hip. So her gait is very wobbly. I'm sure we've seen people limp into our office before. And after the treatment of the pelvic tilt, the patient can walk much better uh, and much smoother. And all I did was to give her two specific injections and it smoothed out, it smooths out her gait by leveling the pelvis. So we need to find what the origin of the pain is and we can do tests to see if there's nerve root irritation just by simple physical examination. And treating the areas that are damaged can be very helpful rather than just giving patients you know, epidural steroids. So the way that I like to give an analogy here is this is kind of like the Eiffel Tower. If you see here, the hips and the pelvis and the sacred tuberous regions are kind of like the base and all these ligamentous structures flow up to the spine. If we have damage anywhere, whether it's damage in the sacroiliac joint or the ligaments that go down to the ischium, which is where people sit, or across to the hip, the entire structure weakens. As that structure weakens, the patient experiences pain. This is why often, especially when I'm treating people with, with back problems, we need to treat each and every one of these individual areas. So we don't just give someone like one injection into their SI joint because it really has a low likelihood of working. When we give patients comprehensive treatments and treat all the ligamentous and tendinous origins and insertions, patients can get significantly better with their back pain and often have very long lasting um, improvement. So anyhow, again, it's not always the disc, um, but sometimes it is. So this is a patient of mine who's uh, 67 years old, an overweight male, unfortunately has weakness in his right leg in addition to back pain. And he had EMGs which showed denervation at, um, at L3 and L4. Um, but his most significant herniation uh, was at L5S1 with a spondylolisthesis. And we injected him into his facet joints. And you can see the large herniation here, which was pressing on the nerve. 
So we did not inject into the disc because injecting into the disc has its complications. We gave him axial injections in order to rebuild the structure and then the disc on its own resorbed and came off the nerve. So the procedures are very, very safe. They don't really need to be done under um, guidance if you know how to inject. And again, it's much, much safer than injecting into the disc. So we don't see patients with discitis or any other types of complications or arachnoiditis because we're not going into that space. And if patients get those complications, they can be really, really difficult um, and long lasting, but we avoid them. So essentially, just to show you again, the way that this worked was that injecting into the joints basically reformed the structure. The structure can get back to its normal form and then this sort of lives within a vacuum and then by elongating the structure, the vacuum will pull the disc back in and pull it off the nerve. The nice thing about it is the patient had complete resolution of the strength um, because the nerve started to function again. He, his strength took about three months to come back. It's about 85% and took about five months to come back to 100%. The patient's still doing very well. So again, it's nice to look at studies. This, here are some preliminary studies. This one showed in 145 back pain patients that pain decreased by about 50% in 89% of patients and 80% improved their functional ability. I think that's pretty good, you know, close to 90% improvement um, in patients. And this is with the few treatments, something called prolotherapy in the lower back. Uh, again, here's more um, studies just showing the different things that were done. With, uh, with back pain, again, these studies were showing improvement. Um, here's a study that was done as well, which just did PRP into the sacroiliac joint. And into the sacroiliac joint, you know, patients had a significant improvement that was long lasting. Some patients have been tracked over four years and still had a significant reduction in their pain. So again, because we're regenerating the joint damage, this isn't something that's going to last three months. I actually have some patients, because I've been doing this for 20 years, I have some patients that I've seen that are 17, 18, 19 years out and are still in very good shape when they were in horrific shape years ago. This study was very interesting because it kind of gets to um, the point of how things can work very quickly. Um, and also how a lot of patients with back pain may not have a problem with their spine. This was injection for gluteus medius and minimus tendinopathy, which basically, when people have an ache here along their hip, that's usually like their glute medius, okay? These patients were given injections of PRP, and again, the studies show that there were significant improvements in their pain. So, at 15 months, the, the patients had still improved, and um, the patients who had a steroid injection only had improvement in six weeks, but at the two-year mark, the patients lost the bed well beyond um, the usefulness of their medication and worn off with the PRP patients and still maintained their benefit. So here was the meta-analysis that was done, and um, this again was looking at different ways that back were treated. This did look at lumbar disc injections, which I don't do. Um, but basically compared studies of sacroiliac joint and facet joint injections, which are easy to do, and found that there was good evidence to suggest that PRP was very good, not only for just regular back pain, but for radicular pain and what seemed to be dysgenic pain. So patients did very well with this. There are a number of other things that um, we can treat with this type of uh, therapy, whether it's neck pain or headaches like I treated with myself. Borreliosis syndrome, post-concussion syndrome in my eyes are very, very, um, very similar. Um, the etiologies we won't get into just for a lack of time, but basically could be structural issues, set issues, Chiari syndromes, which you don't see very often. Um, here, again, you, they're saying on this side, this is a normal cervical sagittal spine. This is straightening of the curve, okay? The curve should be more normal like we see in the left. That's a straighter spine. The straightness in the spine indicates that there's underlying facet joint damage. And that's why you see people that have military necks, but that's what straightening of the spine comes from. It comes from joint damage. You can treat the patient, rebuild their joints, and then their cervical spine will come back to a more normal curvature. It's the muscle spasm that's making the spine act like that goes away. 
So if you ever see patients in your office that have headache and dizziness and blurred vision and difficulty with concentration and focus, uh, sometimes they have facial numbness, sometimes they have heart racing, um, jaw problems, difficulty tracking objects, they may have cervical cranial syndrome, um, which sounds a lot like what patients have a concussion. So many of the people that I see that have these symptoms, they may not have all these symptoms, but they may have some of these symptoms. And usually they have damage to the upper cervical spine and the occiput, which is kind of like what I sustained in my injury, but I didn't recognize it back then. Um, and I had some of these things as well. So treatment to the occiput and treatment to the upper cervical spine with regenerative medicine techniques, whether it's PRP or prolotherapy, uh, can be very, very helpful for patients and help ease their pain. So this study here talks about back pain, but also talks about neck pain. And in the patients who had cervical pain, 81% of them had significant improvement in their pain from treatment with regenerative medicine. Again, a very, very high split rate of success, which is what I've experienced in my office as well, that we see patients doing better. It often takes time, but fortunately, it's a very fun thing to do. And I know that we were talking about physician burnout earlier. It's kind of hard to get burned out when you have a lot of people that become happy after you know, coming into your office and they have significant amounts of pain and disability and they get better, it really makes what you do very worthwhile and really a lot of fun. So there are a lot of other uses for regenerative medicine. Um, we can pretty much treat any joint in the body that you can reach with a needle. Um, so I deal with a lot of hip problems, labral problems, elbow issues, wrist issues. So the good thing is the same type of biology that helps your back, that helps your knee, can help your elbow or shoulder or whatnot, because it's basically just the body healing itself, which is really just very novel and ideal. Um, obviously, you want to pick the right type of regenerative medicine for the right type of problem. For example, you may want to reduce you know, inflammatory mediators in a joint and use PRP or use stem cells to where an MCL spray may just respond easier to something else. So, this is looking at a rotator cuff, and um, patients in the long run with rotator cuff treatment of PRP had very good results, and they did better than patients who had had other types of treatments, including steroids, and the results were long-lasting. You may not be aware of this, but depending upon the severity, there is a very high recurrence rate of rotator cuff tears in patients with surgery. And when patients with tears greater than three and a half centimeters, the rate of recurrence could be over 90% in two years, which is really significant. Early studies showed that the rate of recurrence of tears with large, with large tears using regenerative medicine may be in the 15% range. So it could be significantly improved. And also patients have a lot less pain and disability from the procedure, they have a lot easier recovery in regards to um, their post-operative and post-procedure course. They're not in nine months of agony after having their surgery. So we see a lot of really good um, improvement in patients. I've actually treated patients who have tears as large as five centimeters, which are basically seen as inoperable and have been able to get their function back in their arm, which is really a blessing. We do so also not only just by treating the, the supraspinatus, which is the main tendon that heals, but you have to start looking at the other tendons in the arm that may not show up in the MRI and reinforce and rebuild them. Um, this here, again, looked at treatment of the rotator cuff, and again, they looked by arthroscopy as well, and they saw that the defects improved by 83 um, to 90%, depending upon uh, what concentration of, of um, stem cells that they were using, and the pain and disability in these patients decreased by up to 80%. So again, very, very good results in some of, in some of these studies. This one was published um, last year. Again, this was for rotator cuff and was done in Japan. Anyhow, um, I know I ran through things pretty quickly, but and tried to cover a lot of different topics, but if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Also, as I mentioned, you know, the pelvic tilt treatment that I showed really can be a very simple thing to learn and um, can help patients a lot that come limping into your office. They often think it's, uh, it's magic when they limp in and walk out and uh, it helps them feel better, whether it's with their back or neck or hip. So please contact me or if you have any patient referrals or patient questions, just email me directly and I'd be happy to get back to you. Yes. Serious question, insurance, do they cover this? 
That's the bad thing. Many insurances do not cover treatments like That's this. Medicare. So unfortunately, Medicare does not. So unfortunately, it's often an out-of-pocket expense. Um, I've had some patients over the years to where the company actually will sponsor the treatment and have, if they have um, self-insurance, they will self-insure for this. Some insurers will occasionally cover it, but often not. So um, some executives that I treat also, they have very high level insurances will cover this as well. But we usually tell our patients to expect that it's not gonna cover it, which is unfortunate. It depends. Some treatments could be a few hundred dollars, some treatments could be a few thousand dollars. You know, it just depends upon what's wrong, you know. The chemicals or whatever you're using depends from the actual injectables. Yes, so there's a big difference between using prolotherapy yeah. or PRP or stem cell yeah. procedures. And that's why we try to select what's the best thing for the patient. And it often does take time. And, you know, certain things we have to think about that this could be, you know, an investment for a patient, but again, if they're paying, you know, surgical co-pays nowadays and co-insurance and they're paying for their co-pays for physical therapy and everything else and their time off of work, the cost may not be that different. So one of my patients, she actually tracked her cost and she needed bilateral knee replacement. She was able to quantify between the time off of work that she would have needed for recovery her surgical co-pays and, and co-insurance, her physical therapy co-pays and everything, and her medications, that she was actually pretty much even with what she would have spent through insurance as what her treatment cost with us. It was still expensive, you know, but... How, how, how does it last? I mean, even that varies probably, depending on... Sure, there's gonna be a variable, yeah. just like with knee replacements, yeah. you know, some people may get 10 or 15 years out of it. Okay. And since I've been so doing it's a this... Of years. Well, it depends. I mean, I'm 20 years out from my from my treatment, um, and I have a lot of patients that have been out for a long time, you know, that have done great. But I've seen people with, with bad knees and have seen them back 10 years later for something else. So usually when we get it fixed, it can be a very long-lasting type of treatment. So. Because cost is going to be a... Oh, cost is always an issue. It is, but look, you know, we, that's why typically the patients that we're seeing are more end of the line. They've already tried everything and nothing else is helping them. And usually by physical examination, by history, I'll know if we have a good chance of helping them or not. Because if we can't help them, then there's no sense in spending the money and going through procedures and, and time and, and what, you know, whatever it is. But if we can change it and change them for you know, a permanent period of time, then it's really worth it. To get them out of pain, I mean, their whole quality of life comes back, so. Uh, I'm sorry, she was nice. What's your age range of how young to how old? So I do see some young um, people. Like I, I take care of a lot of competitive gymnastics, um, a lot of competitive gymnasts, and sometimes you see them as young as nine years old. Like I had a poor girl who had osteochondritis at her elbow at age nine. Um, so we see these young people, um, and a lot of the gymnasts that I see are extremely high level. They're very competitive, like they're Olympic level kids and um, that's kind of the youngest that we see. I've had some patients in their 90s also and um, you know so it's really an age range but most people we see are usually in their mid 40s to you know mid 70s 80s is, is typical so a lot of times also the young kids and they really heal very very quickly 